Uh, well, continuing in Matthew today, I'll be reading from chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd sat on, stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky ground, where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Anyone who has ears should listen. Then the disciples came up and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them, Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given for, to them. For whoever has... More will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, You will listen and listen, yet never understand, and you will look and look yet never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn back, and I would cure them. But your eyes are blessed, because they do see, and your ears, because they do hear. For I assure you, Many prophets and righteous people long to see the things you see, yet didn't see them, to hear the things you hear, yet didn't hear them. You then listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the words, hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground... This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When pressure or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the seduction of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground... This is the one who hears and understands the word, who bears fruit and yields, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for him coming, being human, and teaching. Father, we will learn today that it is your gift, whether we understand or not. We pray that this day you would help us to understand, to see you aright as you truly are. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hasn't it been good in the last few weeks, well, last couple of months now, to refocus on Jesus? The series on what I love about Jesus and then the last few weeks looking at Matthew 12 have been a great reminder of our Lord, his many perfections and how great it is to know him as Lord and Saviour. Now today, as Bernard said earlier, we begin, uh, there's a slight, in chapter 13 of Matthew, there's a slight change of direction. It's not dramatic, but it's certainly there. Now, Matthew now brings us a series of parables where the kingdom of heaven comes back to the forefront. In chapter 12, which we've been looking at, Matthew has described the beginning of the direct conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus. And he's done this through recording 
Jesus making a number of clear divisions. And just a reminder of those. People either go one way or another and there's no middle path. There is Satan or Jesus. Demon possession or demons cast out. We're either against Jesus or with him. We either scatter from him or we gather with him. We either bear bad fruit or we bear good fruit. We either have evil treasure or we have good treasure. We speak words that condemn or words that justify. And most personally, as we heard last week, we're either outside his heavenly kingdom or we are his mother and brothers. Jesus made it plain, isn't he? There are two kingdoms, his and Satan's, and we can't sit somewhere in between. There's no in between. You're either his or Satan's. Today we begin the parables of what the kingdom of heaven is like or can be compared with. Now Jesus speaks the first three of these parables to the crowds and as we heard today, he's floating offshore on the Sea of Galilee in a boat, speaking to them standing on the shore. The last four are spoken only to the disciples in a house nearby. And Jesus explains two of these parables. But those explanations are only given to his disciples. Now the parable of the sower is a bit different to the ones that follow. It's not trying to describe what the kingdom's like. Rather, it explains the different reactions of people to the announcement of the kingdom that Jesus is making. The parable is a partial explanation of why people are either in the kingdom or not in the kingdom. Let's turn to that parable now. As we've heard in the kids' talk, Jesus describes four soils. The hard-packed soil of the path, the soil full of rocks that cannot hold much water, the soil that's full of thorn seed and the good soil. Now, you would have noticed in the demonstration that Penny and Jess brought us that the soils give different amounts of growth. The seed that forms on the path is quickly gone. The seed in the rocky soil germinates but quickly shrivels up when the sun comes out and dries up the soil that is between the rocks. The weedy soil gives growth for some time and looks healthy but it never yields anything because the crop gets choked out by the weeds. Only the good soil goes on to produce the fruit that the seed was sown to generate. There are four soils but three of them are unfruitful. That division that we've been seeing in Matthew 12, it's continued here. It's not a division into four now. The soil is either fruitful or it's not fruitful. Now the reason Jesus has split the unfruitful soils into three types is to help the disciples and to help us see that people react differently when the kingdom of God is proclaimed. Whether that proclamation is by the king, Jesus, whether it's by the disciples, or whether it's by us. People receive the news of the kingdom in different ways. Now if we turn to his explanation in verses 18 to 23, Jesus makes this clear. The soils represent people, as we heard. He says in verse 19, when anyone hears the word about the kingdom, so that is the sowing of the seed, the hearing of the word, someone speaking the word about the kingdom and someone else hearing. What reason does Jesus give for people to respond to the word about the kingdom of heaven in different ways? People might be like the soils. 
Either the seed doesn't penetrate and drop germinate at all, Satan takes it away. They might be like locking ground. Germinates just fine. Looks normal. The sun comes out. The hard times and the persecution of this world, it shrivels and dies. People might be like the seed among the thorns, grow up, look normal for even longer. Look like there might be a crop there. No farmers are familiar with that. Look like there might be a crop there and then the thorns drown it out and you harvest nothing. There's a sort of warning here for the disciples, isn't there? There'll be those who respond with joy when they hear the word of the kingdom, but they won't persevere. There'll be those who look like true members of the kingdom, maybe for years, but the things, things of this world, either the pain or the pleasure, will take them away. The disciples are going to see that happen, aren't they? They'll see people apparently come to faith and then not continue. Don't get disheartened, Jesus is telling them. Expect it. Many people will look like members of the kingdom, but they'll fall away. That's the way it is. Now, sandwiched between the parable and Jesus' explanation of it later to his disciples, there's a question from the disciples and Jesus' response. It might be a question that you are, you've asked yourself at some times. Why don't you speak more clearly, Jesus? Why don't you make it plainer who you are? What do the disciples ask? Why are you speaking to them in parables? Now, the disciples have been following Jesus closely. They've been seeing what he's doing. And they're probably struggling with why so many people are opposed to him. And as I said, the unspoken question behind their question is, why don't you speak more clearly? And in a way, it's a similar question to the Pharisees. Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Teacher, clearly show us who you are. But the motivation for the question is totally different, isn't it? The disciples want others to know who Jesus is like they know who Jesus is. The Pharisees were demanding a performance. Why didn't you make it more clear who you are? That's not God's way. There are those who do believe. There are those who have ears to hear. There are two soils, fruitful, unfruitful. Where's the difference come from? Jesus explains that it is understanding that makes the difference. This understanding is a knowledge that is given. Reading from verse 11. He answered the disciples' question. Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That is why I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. It's been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. Jesus is talking about the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's doing when he explains the parables to the disciples later on. He's giving them the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. But it hasn't been given to others, has it? 
and for them there'll also be a taking away of what knowledge they do have. They look but don't see. They hear but don't listen. They haven't been given understanding. Who are they? They're any one of the three unfruitful soils. If you look back carefully at Jesus' explanation of the parable, you'll see that it's only the good soil that produces fruit that understands. From verse 23. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who produces fruit and yields, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. And that understanding has been given to the disciples. It's not something they have within themselves. It's given. So we learn here, without God's gracious gift of knowledge and understanding, we are all, all unfruitful soil. We all have dull hearts, deaf ears, closed eyes. That's our natural state. In the reading we had in Deuteronomy 29, Moses is preaching to the Israelite nation not long before they enter the Promised Land. Now this land, God has given it to them. God has freed them from Egypt. He's led them. He's provided food. He's provided water for them. He's done miracles among them. God has given them the law. Yet Moses tells them, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind to understand, eyes to see, or ears to hear. All that evidence, all those years of God revealing who he is, and they still could not see or hear. They still did not know or understand God. It doesn't matter how plain the evidence is. If God hasn't given us the knowledge and the understanding, we won't be fruitful for him. And we won't be part of his kingdom. Now sometimes God does not give knowledge or understanding. But sometimes God goes further than that. Sometimes it is actually God's purpose to blind and to deafen. Verses 14 and 15 are quoting from the passage we had read from Isaiah 6. Isaiah has a vision of God. He's convicted of his sin to the point of a mental breakdown. And then he's graciously cleansed. Cleansed of his sin and given a commission. Now, not many people would take up the job that Isaiah's given. He's commanded to preach the truth so that the people of Israel have dull hearts, blind eyes and deaf ears. I'll just read the 14 and 15 again. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them which says, You will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they've shut their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their hearts, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn back, and I would heal them. Isaiah's job description was to bring about that outcome. His job description was to preach to hardened hearts so that people wouldn't repent. And he was to do that until God demonstrated who he is through his judgment of the nation of Israel. And he was successful. And Isaiah and the Disciples probably thought that was the prophecy fulfilled when Israel was exiled to Assyria. Yet here is Jesus saying it's fulfilled now. Here is the clearest evidence of who God is. Man, God in flesh, 
before them and they can't see it. Jesus is the person who casts a shadow forward, forward in history and back in history. And Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled by the hard hearts, the deaf ears, the blind eyes that Jesus encounters. We learn from Isaiah's experience and from Jesus' experience that the message of the truth of the kingdom can actually harden hearts. Not many want to hear about their sin. Not many want to hear their greatest need is for a saviour. Not many want to know that Jesus is the king who commands his people to do his will. Isn't that what we see? People turn away more and more strongly. They become harder and harder. And the seed is all the easier to be snatched away. Now there are a whole heap of pastoral implications from this passage. I'm going to name a few, but if you think even a little bit about the passage, there are many more. As I've mentioned, one of the things that Jesus is doing here is explaining to the disciples what they're going to see, what's going, the opposition that they're going to face from others with hard hearts when they proclaim the kingdom, and also what they're going to see in those they think are the people of God. They will have people who apparently are the people of God and then fall away. Jesus is preparing the disciples so they don't become discouraged when they see these things happening around them. Jesus' explanation that we've just gone through also helps us understand why people react so differently to hearing God's word. Understanding is a gift from God. The seed sown is the same. It explains to parents why two children brought up in the same household taught the same truth. One will reject Jesus and one will accept him. I'm not sure that's particularly comforting to know why it happens, but it still prepares us for reality. But the parable also helps us to know what to pray for our children, to pray that God will give them the knowledge and the understanding and explains why Paul prays for a spirit of knowledge of God for the believers he writes to. It explains why Paul gives thanks to God for the knowledge that he's given to believers. But the thing I found comforting from this passage was that it shows Jesus' love and concern for his disciples. He knows what he's sending them out to face. He knows that teaching about the kingdom will face rejection and opposition. And he knows they'll become discouraged. And he is their loving saviour and he is preparing them. This will come. Do not be surprised but keep sowing. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you've been good to us beyond all we deserve. You have brought understanding and knowledge. You have opened eyes, opened ears, changed our hearts. We know a fraction, a fraction of your goodness. We praise you and thank you that we know what we know. Help us to persevere, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.